Good evening and welcome to the Wistar Institute in sunny, snowy Philadelphia and our annual celebration of all things small yet visually powerful. My name is James Hayden and I'm Managing Director of the Imaging Shared Resource here at Wistar. That basically means that my colleagues and I are responsible for a lot of fancy microscopes that help our scientists look deep inside cells to understand how they work in both healthy conditions as well as in cancer and infectious disease. Among other noted achievements, Wistar was responsible for developing the vaccines for rabies and German measles, also known as rubella. And even now, our researchers are heavily involved in a COVID candidate that is currently in early stage clinical trials, as well as two other COVID vaccines, but who's counting? Wistar was also the first National Cancer Institute basic cancer research center in the country, a designation we've upheld since 1972. Our scientists do the basic research that uh, create the foundation for finding new ways to diagnose and treat cancer. But every year about this time, we pause from our labors to slow down a little and marvel at a world that few of us get a chance to see. And that's the world as viewed through the microscope. We've been a proud supporter of Nikon's international small world competition for 18 years now, hosting the traveling exhibit of winning entries as they work their way around the country. For each of those years, we've also kicked off things with an opening night reception where anyone has been allowed to join us. Well, unfortunately, we can't invite you here in person this year, but we still have the opportunity to carry on our tradition and take advantage of technology and extend our invitation to even more of you through this virtual event. As always, we try to give you a different perspective on working with the microscope, as well as the motivations of the people behind the images. So to start things off this year, we're going to take a quick look at some important cancer research being done here at Wistar and show you how we use our microscopes in our daily work. Let me introduce you to Irena Bertolini. Irena, Irena comes to us from Italy and is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of our president and CEO, Dr. Dario Altieri. We've worked together for a few years now and a good amount of her research on mitochondrial function in cancer development involves imaging live cells, often in three dimensions and often using time-lapse using our confocal microscopes. You'll hear a lot about confocals from the other presenters as well. So let me just give a quick explanation of what they can do. So unlike a regular microscope that you might remember from high school or college, most confocals use laser light and a special pinhole aperture that makes it possible to visually section through an entire cell or even a larger tissue without damaging it. And then you have the instrument capture multiple images as you focus through and the software puts all that together into 3D data sets. It's some amazing stuff and you'll see some great examples of just how this can help the research and the presentations ahead. So now I'll pass the mic over to Irena so she can tell you more about her work in our facilities and what she sees when she fires up the lasers. So Irena, if you could turn on your camera. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Irene, and I'm a postdoc fellow at the, in the LTRS lab at the Wister Institute in Philadelphia. So I started working and playing with microscope and images uh, back in Italy during my PhD, and I brought my passion here in the United States. What I've always found really fascinating about the microscope and imaging techniques in general is that they give you the opportunity to look at biological events and phenomena directly inside the cells. So the microscope gives you the opportunity to see what is going on inside in live cells and in live time. You can look at the protein interaction, the movement of different organelles, and you can also see the interaction between different cells. And actually right now the, techno the techniques are developing so fast and now we're able to study biological event in live time in a live animal, in full animal. For example, we can do imaging now on a mouse model in which we can study, obviously with a different resolution compared to when we study with cancer cell, but still you can see biological event that's going on in live animal. And in particular, what I always found what I found that is particularly fascinating about uh, and satisfying about this uh, world, the imaging world, is that after all the work and all the time that you spend uh, doing this, dedicating to that, it is so nice, so that it looks so good, like these images here. 
So today in particular, I'm going to talk you about uh, some, uh, show you about some images that I produced in Altieri's lab. So in Altieri's lab, we are focusing in particular in study the role of mitochondria in cancer progression. Why we study mitochondria? Well, mitochondria are the central source of energy in our cells and they play a central role in different diseases, including cancer. Mitochondria produce the energy for, uh, that permit the cells to move, migrate, um, proliferate, and these are all fundamental for cancer progression, invasion, and metastatization. When we study mitochondria in cancer cells, we are particularly interested in answering two, three different questions in our lab. What we want to know is where the mitochondria are localized within the cells, what is their shape, and what protein do they contain. To answer to all these questions, we use the confocal microscope. We use the confocal microscope because uh, this microscope not only makes our images look good, but it also allows us to gain a better understanding of the cells, of the structure within the cells, and the tissue in general. This is because the confocal microscope combines high-resolution optical imaging with depth selectivity. And that means that we can visualize really tiny structure that otherwise would be impossible to see and we do a 3D reconstruction of them that give us a lot of information about biological function within the cell. So when we look at uh, cells in uh, at the microscope we usually label these cells with different dye and each dye is represented by different color. For example, in these images here on the left, these are cancer cells stained with three different dyes. We have the actin cytoskeleton that is in white, the mitochondria that are in magenta, and the nuclei in cyan. You can see in these images, you can distinguish each single cell. So you can say that this is one cell, this is another one, but you can't really distinguish what is within the cells inside them. But the confocal microscope allows us to zoom in, so to increase the resolution of these images. And now on the images on the right, you can see how you, you can clearly define the actin filament of these cells, as well as the mitochondria. We can actually improve even better the quality of these images, and we can generate something like this. So this is a 3D reconstruction of a cancer cell staining for uh, the mitochondria that are again in magenta and the nuclei that are in blue. And these kind of images allow us to answer to the, our first question. So where are the mitochondria localized within the cells? And why we are interested in that? Well, based on their position in the, in the cell, the mitochondria have, uh, can, are able to provide energy for different functions. So when the mitochondria are localized close to the nuclei, like in these cells, Usually, these cells are characterized by slow migration, slow movement. Instead, usually in cancer progression and in aggressive cancer cell, you have a, a distribution of the mitochondria that look like this one. So you have the mitochondria spread to the periphery of the cell, where they are able to provide the energy for the movement and the migration of these cells. So usually cells with mitochondria localized at the periphery are, are cells characterized by fast migration. How the um, mitochondria move from the nuclei to the periphery of the cells is another important question for us. And the uh, mitochondria move through a pretty complex com um, phenomenon that is called mitochondrial dynamics that involve the continuous change in shape of the mitochondria. So this is why we have our second question. What is the mitochondrial shape? So in these images, again, in this image again, you have a 3D reconstruction of cancer cell in which you have the mitochondria in magenta and the nuclei in blue. And here we can answer to our, our second question. So what's the shape of the mitochondria? So as I told you before, when the mitochondria move from the nuclei to the periphery of the cell, they change their shape. Usually what happens is that they uh, one elongated mitochondria that looks like this one fragment, so divide, and in a smaller mitochondria that are usually called fragmented, like this one. The fragmented mitochondria are smaller and they are able to move faster and better within the cells. So usually cells that are characterized by high motility 
are uh, uh, their mitochondria within the cells are characterized by fragmented shape like this one and you can see all these one are whole fragmented mitochondria how this phenomenon of mitochondrial dynamics is regulated is regulated by different protein and the localization of this protein within the cells is important for the regulation of the mechanism so this is why our third question is what protein the mitochondria contain so when for example, studying the fragmentation of the mitochondria that lead to their position to the periphery and so the movement of the cells. We have uh, one particular protein that is here in this uh, Friedrich construction is marked in red, whereas the mitochondria are in uh, green. This protein to be active and is to localize within the mitochondria. When this protein moves from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria, activate the process that induces the fragmentation of the mitochondria and so the repositioning. And now you can see here in these images, we can clearly distinguish that this protein in red localized with the mitochondria. So this is another important information for us and our study. So just to conclude, the microscope not only makes our images look great, and it does, you will see in the next presentation, but what is most important is that it's a powerful tool that allows us to answer to important biological questions. Thank you all for the attention. Great, thank you, Irena. It's amazing, just another day at the office, you know, hey, but uh, um, it always amazes me the kind of detail that you can pull out of, uh, of images these days. It is the data. Okay, so the research that we do here at WISTAR depends on high quality images like those on a daily basis. But that doesn't mean that every image is ready to be framed and hung on a wall. The primary purpose for our images, as Irena just showed you, is to advance scientific inquiry. But the main reason for our gathering every year is to celebrate the images selected for Small World, which transcend the science and become both art and science. So to tell us a little bit more about the competition, let me introduce you to my good friend, Eric Flem. Eric is the communications manager at Nikon Instruments and the guiding force behind the competition. He's speaking with us today from his home on, on Long Island in New York. So welcome, Eric. Turn on your uh, camera there and we'll see you. Great, thanks. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, as uh, Jamie said, uh, I'm Eric Lem. I've been uh, uh, with Nikon and running the Small World Competition now for, uh, I believe it's 21 years. Um, it's been, uh, the competition is in its uh, 45th year of, uh, of uh, use. And, um, you know, it, it's one of these things where I've always said, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because uh, Jamie and I talk about it all the time. Uh, I've said this is, um the the largest photo contest of any kind in the world and um yesterday jamie actually brought up to me he said i don't exactly know how you define that and so um this year um for example we had about um 300 entries into the small world in motion competition and we had just under 2000 entries into the um, nikon small world small world in motion is the movie competition and is uh 10 years old that was started uh only 10 years ago um what may th there are a lot of competitions out there that are much uh larger uh in terms of you know getting entrance because obviously you know not everybody has a microscope not everybody has that kind of technology um however where this contest really um shows its um shows its its might is in the amount of people that that uh engage and and see uh, the imagery from the competition uh this year alone um just to name a few uh cnn has covered it Business Insider has covered it, uh, Google, Washington Post, National Geographic, Smithsonian. Uh, the list literally goes on and on and on. Uh, we estimate that there are roughly about three to four hundred million uh, views for the images with all the with all the media that that we get. Uh, the the intro. By the way, just so just so you guys know, this year was the first year ever that we've judged the competition via digital means as well. <clears throat> so we actually uh, did it via Zoom. Um, 
the contest is, like I said, started in 1975. And, and what's happened over the years is we've amassed um, really the, one of the largest um, collections of scientific art in the world. Um, it, you know, it, it's become a massive collection. And it, sort of an accidental thing that happened during, during that period of time is what it's also done is it's created kind of a visual artistic timeline for the technology that um, that has has developed over the years, you know, at, at the beginning when when this started, you know, people were using straight microscopes with um, uh, film cameras on them. Um, it, probably many many people were actually physically drawing images at at the time that this thing was was started, although those weren't entered into the competition. And you can kind of see the progression through the years of of uh the the technology that and imaging technologies probably one of the most um uh um you know the, the most uh, um obvious or most uh, telling is when digital imaging uh came to pass um the the numbers of our entries just grew exponentially and it was really just because it was much easier to capture this kind of image so, I, I mean, you've seen some amazing technology already um, with ARENA, and um, you're going to see some more. Um, as you look at these images, just keep in mind that this is um, a showcase of the technology, but it's also a showcase of how powerful the technology mixed with the, the genius and creativity of the scientific community that uh, make this uh, just you know, I mean, they're bringing things to science at in in a pace that we've never seen before. Um, so, you know, enjoy and um, enjoy it. Great, thank you, Eric, and thank you for bringing this experience to people around the world. It's uh, it's a very unique thing to do. Okay, so it's a great achievement to have your image selected for any position in Small World, but to be chosen for number one takes something truly special. Daniel Castronova is with us today from the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Washington, D.C. He will be telling us about his amazing image of the lymphatic system in a zebrafish. The best images in Small World have quite a story to tell, and Daniel's is quite impressive. Working in the lab of Dr. Brant Weinstein and collaborating with his uh, colleague, uh, Bakari Samasa, his images are not only visually stunning, but also scientifically significant. You'll be impressed with his results, but in the still imaging category, which is what that was uh, that you'll be seeing first, also keep in mind that he also received an honorable mention for his entry in the Small World in Motion competition as well. So here's Dan to talk to us about both of these. Um, so Dan, turn on your camera and mic, and we'll, this will be great. Thank you. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, I just want to start out by saying, um, you know, Eric did a great job describing um, the contest, and it really is a true honor to have won first place this year. I, I still can't really even believe that I won. Uh, but uh, uh, today I'm here to actually tell you about some of the work uh, we do in the laboratory at the NIH and show you some of the beautiful images uh, that we acquire. So I work uh, in Brent Weinstein's laboratory at the National Institutes of Health where we use zebrafish as a model to study vascular development or how blood vessels grow. Uh, and this first image is, is an image of uh, zebrafish at a few different stages, showing the blood vessels in magenta and the lymphatic vessels uh, in yellow and green. And the zebrafish have become a really popular uh, animal model for, for many different reasons, but one is that the eggs are laid outside of the mother and fertilized outside of the mother, so we can actually watch them develop. And as they develop, the embryos are clear, so we can watch organs as they form. So it's become a really important model. Um, and just to give you an idea of a sense of scale, uh, you can see this zebra, zebrafish zygote or fertilized egg there next to uh, a fluorescent sesame seed uh, to give you an idea of how big these, these uh, eggs are when they're first laid. 
Uh, and I wanted to start off with the, the video that, that won uh, this year's Small World Honorable Mention, uh, Small, World, Small World in Motion Honorable Mention. Uh, and it's a video showing uh, development of zebrafish from a single cell to about 22 hours post-fertilization. Uh, and I think it really hits home another reason why this uh, animal model is so nice. It develops really quickly. Uh, overnight, you end up with uh, an embryo that has a brain, an eye, and several organ systems already developing. And since we study blood vessels in our laboratory, uh, this particular embryo is transgenic and expressing a fluorescent protein. So we get to see those, those first blood vessels as they form. To orient you, the chorion is the outer membrane around the egg. The yolk you can see there is, um, is what the embryo is going to live off of for the next five days. And the cell at the top is that half moon looking thing. It's at the single cell stage right now. So fertilization probably happened maybe 20 minutes before I got this up on the scope and ready to start imaging. So the first thing we see are these waves of symmetric cell division. Um, and the next we'll see is uh, different tissue layers actually start to form and those cells grow around the yolk ball. When we watch closely, we can see the head is beginning to form on one side and the tail is going to butt off on the other. And most importantly for our laboratory, the blood vessels are starting to form. So these are the earliest cells that are gonna form the tubes that hold the blood for the uh, embryo. So uh, by two and a half days old, the zebrafish here has a beating heart, blood vessels, brain, eye, uh, primitive kidney. You can see pigments are starting to develop. Those are those black splotches throughout the body. And we'll go ahead and take a look. This is a movie as well, showing how blood, it's, it's easy for us to actually in blood circulating through blood vessels and embryos at this stage. A close up of the trunk reveals these poker chip like blood vessels cruising through uh, blood cells. When we take a look, closer look at the head, we can see blood cells moving through blood vessels in the brain, the heart beating at the bottom. This fish is transgenic, so the blood ve vessels are labeled in green here, and the blood cells are labeled in magenta. You can see a really neat pattern in the retina if you look through the lens of the eye there. We take a close look at the heart. We see, unlike mammalian, er, unlike human hearts, zebrafish hearts have two chambers. Uh, but even by two and a half days, you can see an amazing valve that's uh, passing blood cells from one chamber to the next. So I think it's obvious from watching those movies that zebrafish are a really great model for studying early development. Uh, but it turns out there's actually a lot of interesting things that happen uh, during zebrafish development after, um, you know, after the, the early stages from, say, five days to, to adulthood at, at about two and a half months. Uh, but we haven't really studied that as much. And one reason is because the fish start to develop pigment and the pigment gets in, way, in the way of our imaging. Um, so what scientists have done is we've created zebrafish that lack pigment. And this allows us to study development throughout uh, fr from early development to later stages of development and even look more deeply into uh, adults. And these are Casper zebrafish swimming on your screen here. And I hope you can appreciate, if you look closely, you can actually see the brain uh, inside um, these fish. You can see the, the spinal cord uh, and the organs just, and this is, I took this video actually on my iPhone. This, these fish are about, uh, are full grown. They're about an inch and a half long. And that leads me to the project that I was working on when I took the image uh, that, that won the small world. So I was uh, interested in the vessels around the brain, but not the blood vessels. There's another type of vessel called lymphatic vessels. Uh, and recently in 2015, the first lymphatic vessels associated with the brain were characterized. Uh, and this has been really important because in the past few years, these vessels have been shown in mammals have been shown to uh, be involved in important things like treating brain tumors, the development of Alzheimer's, and even neurodegenerative disorders. Um, but as you can imagine, this work, most of this work was done in mice. It's difficult to image uh, lymphatic vessels in this, in, in the, around the brain of a mouse, but it's much easier to do in zebrafish. So when I took a close look at our zebrafish transgenic, I noticed that we, there was actually a really nice 
intricate pattern of lymphatic vessels growing around the brain. So this was really exciting. So it meant that we can use zebrafish as a tool to study these vessels and we can image them and image them in real time. Uh, and it was at that time when I was looking at um, a double transgenic that labeled both bones, in, in this image you can see the bones in red, and lymphatic vessels in green. And what I was doing is I was taking more high magnification images than this of the, of the lymphatic vessels themselves, trying to figure out which vessels are inside the skull and which vessels are outside the skull. And it was at that time that I noticed the scales actually were really beautiful. And I thought it would be cool to take a picture, a more zoomed out picture, because I also knew that the bone, that there were bones inside the, the fins that I thought might look cool. So I took this, this image is actually a tile. It's actually three separate confocal stacks, which was discussed before. And then the image was flattened and I acquired this data. And then I actually didn't have time to process it. So I never saw it. A couple of weeks later, I was processing the data and I made the max projection. And this is what I saw. I was absolutely stunned by the beauty of the image. Um, and when we acquire images on confocal microscopes, uh, they assign colors to the, the channels. When we acquire, acquire the channels, it's, it's really in grayscale, but the computer assigns colors. So for green fluorescent protein, it assigns green, red, it assigns red. So this is what I first saw. I thought it was really beautiful, but I also knew that there are a lot of people out there that are red, green, colorblind. So I wanted to make the image more accessible before I submitted it. I knew once I saw it, I had to submit it to Nikon Small World. So I tinkered around with the settings uh, to try and figure out what color scheme I like the best. And I settled on this. This is where, where we have blue bones and scales uh, and orange lymphatics. I just thought it was uh, really a nice image. Um, and so this is what I submitted. And then as we discussed earlier, when you take uh, when you get data off a confocal, one of the reasons it looks so nice is because you've excluded out of focus light and you've uh, you've you've flattened the image. But the the data is actually three dimensional, and so I want to show you this movie, which is the, it's the same data set that I sub, that I got the image from from small for Small World. But uh, when we play this movie, you can see it's actually three dimensional, and this is important for us as scientists because it allows us to understand where these vessels are in relation to, in this case, the skull. Um, or in relation to other vessels, or in relation to the nervous system. Uh, you can also see here, you know, it's, the channels are completely separate, so we can pull one away and put it back uh, and really give us a chance to understand uh, the anatomy of the developing lymphatic system in fish. So obviously winning Nikon Small World was just completely amazing. And then finding out that they were going to put the image on the cover of Nature Methods was actually totally awesome as well. So another great honor uh, to have this year. Uh, and after, you know, right around the time this was happening, we were finishing up our uh, lymphatic vessel story. Uh, and I was, I wanted to prepare some images to try and submit for the cover of the journal that we had, had submitted to. So I, uh, I acquired another data set um, with a similar, with the same transgenic. Um, but this time I took the whole fish uh, and this is actually three, the three fish are the same image, just displayed different orientation and in different colors. And so I put together this image and a few other images and submitted to submitted them to Circulation Research where our paper had been accepted. Um, sadly, they didn't pick this, um, this image for the cover, but happily they picked one of the other images we submitted for the cover. So this is uh, the same transgenic, but a lateral view looking at the eye of a slightly older fish, again, with the bone, and scale in blue, and the lymphatic vessels in orange. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to thank Nikon. It's been amazing to, to have been selected um, as the winner of the Small World this year. Absolutely amazing. Um, Charles River is the company. I, I worked through a contracting company at the uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, Brant Weinstein is um, the leader of the laboratory, and he's the one that trusts with all his super fancy imaging equipment. So that's uh, really nice. Uh, and and Dr. is a post in the laboratory who uh, was a big help uh, throughout the uh, lymphatic, uh, understanding intracranial lymphatics throughout that story. And I want to thank everyone for uh, attending uh, tonight. Okay, thank you, Dan. I think you had a lock in first place, regardless of which one of those images you actually sent. They're all great. Okay, so next up is Jason Kirk from the Optical Imaging and Vital Microscopy Corps at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. 
So uh, an interesting thing that many of you may not know about this competition is that you can only submit three entries every year. It can be tough to get into the top 10. So what does it take to get two in the top 10? Well, Jason received both seventh and ninth place this year for his two entries, and then he followed that up with his third as an image of distinction. So clearly he was in the zone. Here's Jason to tell us about our favorite, which is a seventh place entry, which I think looks kind of like a robin's nest, uh, as well as the rest of his amazing submissions. So uh, Jason, if you turn on your camera and mic, we'll hear from you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for the introduction, and thank you to uh, everyone at the Wistar Institute and Nikon Instruments for having me today. Um, it's not often that we get to talk uh, about the aesthetic aspects uh, of imaging. Um, as Jamie mentioned earlier, a lot of the science today uh, based around microscopy is highly data-driven. Um, and so the sort of more aesthetic and, and prettiness of images is often an afterthought. Uh, in these kind of things, but the small world competition does an awesome job uh, at really highlighting this stuff uh, And it's really a, a fun thing to do ultimately at the end of the day um, So just a little bit about myself if you if those of you who don't know me um, I am a, a career microscopist. Um, I have been uh, in the microscopy business for 23 years um, I started off uh, at the Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole uh, supporting uh, the plethora of summer courses that go on there um, before moving to the Yukon Health Science Center to help uh, run a core facility uh, with Dr. Les Lowe and Ann Cowan. Um, I really cut my teeth on cutting edge microscopy with those two experiences and they were, they were invaluable to my professional development. Uh, and then I moved on to, uh, to corporate life uh, at Carl Zeiss. I spent 13 years uh, in the advanced imaging division there before moving to the Baylor College of Medicine in 2017 uh, to run the optical imaging and vital microscopy core. Um, and we are a core facility here. So what that means essentially is we have a collection of extremely high-end uh, microscope systems um, from Confocal, which has been mentioned already. Um, to multi-photon, to OPT, to, um, to light sheet microscopy, uh, as well as um, even some X-ray micro CT uh, we dip our, our, our toes into. Um, so a lot of fun instrumentation to work with here. Um, and, but today I wanna talk to you a little bit more about um, the artistic side of microscopy and, and to, get, to kind of give you a behind the scenes look at how some of these images uh, are created. Um, so the first one I want to talk about um, is uh, the seventh place finisher in the small world competition this year, which is a BPAE cell. Uh, these are cultured cell models that are used in biological research, primarily because these cells um, are really perfect for microscopy. They're flat uh, and they're completely transparent. Um, these particular cell lines were derived from the pulmonary arteries of cows, um, and they're used widely um, in all kinds of, uh, of biomedical research. This particular image was taken on a confocal microscope um, with some enhanced resolution capabilities um, referred to as the AriScan, um, which is a super resolution platform um, for these confocal uh, microscopes that allow you to push the resolution down past uh, the, the, the limit of physics, um, which typically is around 200 nanometers for these microscopes. Um, this particular image was collected at around 100 nanometers uh, in resolution. And what you're looking at here is three different things. You're looking at um, actin in black, and you're looking at uh, DNA in blue, uh, and then the microtubules, which really are the star of the show of this image, um, are in orange. Uh, and from an artistic standpoint, really the first thing that we look for uh, in a good image, essentially, uh, is a compelling subject. Um, and culture cell models, especially microtubules, are highly dynamic. And so they're, they're branching off and creating all kinds of really cool patterns. Um, and this particular one I chose because I've never seen microtubules form quite the storm that they're forming uh, in this image. Um, and to have them form in a circle like this that reminds me ultimately of a hurricane and being uh, from the Houston area here in Texas, uh, we're intimately familiar with hurricanes. Um, but that, that really, that shape and that structure was really the foundation of uh, building this image. Uh, and the second component of this, uh, creating a good compelling uh, fluorescence image is really to decide on the coloring scheme. Um, and Dan mentioned uh, earlier choosing the, the orange and blue. Um, really, this is a, a photography technique uh, using color theory, right? And use, choosing complementary colors uh, to each other that, that work well together. And sometimes that's really difficult to do with a three color experiment, which is why 
a lot of my images you'll see uh, are have one of these colors or one of these channels are monochromatic. Um, so there's no color associated with it at all, like the actin in this example is black. Um, primarily to keep that complementary color scheme going um, when you're building the image. Uh, because one of the things that you may or may not know about fluorescence microscopy and fluorescence microscopes is the original raw images that are generated by this microscope are actually monochromatic. Um, so there's no color information associated with these, uh, with these images at all in the beginning. Um, and primarily that's because the fluorescence technique is light limited. So what that means is that uh, there's only so much signal that comes back from uh, the fluorescence when we shine light on it. And so because of that, these instruments have to use really sensitive detectors and you don't want color filters and other things reducing the signal intensity that you're able to collect. So the original images look like this. And so what we have to do is basically pick and choose uh, what kind of color schemes we want to apply uh, to the data that comes from each of the independent channels here. Um, and they really, they really are, give you a ton of flexibility to, to select different color schemes to be able to, to make a compelling image. Um, and one sort of final note I wanna say about uh, this particular slide, and I'm gonna hold it up here a little bit, hopefully you can see that. Um, I use these cells not for a scientific reason. Um, I use these cells primarily to benchmark my equipment. Um, and so what that means is I, I spend a lot of time here at the core making sure this instrumentation works well for our researchers here. Uh, and so we need a way to be able to identify where problems are. Um, and it starts with these cells. Um, and these cells were actually created uh, uh, by a lab at uh, FSU. Uh, you may know the name Mike Davidson. Uh, Mike Davidson was a longtime microscopist who passed away a number of years ago. Uh, and he was a really big sort of guy in this community. Um, and he actually created this slide, uh, his lab. Uh, this came directly from his group. Um, and I've had this for almost 15 years. Um, and so it's been in my collection um, and I use it almost every week. Um, and it's still bright as the day that I got it. Um, so it's just a real testament to how labs can create this stuff and do an exceptional job at, at sample preparation, uh, which is probably, I would say, 80% of what goes into building really cool images like this, uh, is being able to prepare samples uh, effectively. Uh, and that leads me into my next uh, image, um, which is the ninth place finisher here uh, at the Small World this year. Um, which is called uh, connections between hippocampal neurons. So this is a great, this image is a great example of how the core works here. So we have what's called an open air core. Um, all of our instruments, we have nine in total, uh, are basically located in a single room. Um, and they're separated by some small partitions, but for the most part, the partitions are always open. Um, the images are displayed and, and controlled on very large monitors, typically 32 inches and larger. So when you're walking through the core, you can kind of see what everyone is doing. Um, and every so often, users will be doing experiments that'll catch your eye. And this was, was a really good example of that. So Quinn Wen um, from Joanna Jankowski's lab here at BCM um, was imaging these cells um, one day during her experiments. And they're using them to study the effects of a particular lysosomal protein on dendritic spine development. And dendritic spines are where communication happens between neuronal cells. Um, and so they have, they, this communication has in the development uh, of this protein and, and how this, these spines develop has broader implications for things like Alzheimer's uh, and Parkinson's research. Um, and that's their broader goals here, their scientific goals. Uh, and so this particular model system uh, is a single label, believe it or not, um, where a yellow fluorescent protein was introduced by a virus. So the cells are cultured. Uh, and the viral vector is introduced uh, to the cells after a few days of growth. Uh, and that virus infects the cells uh, and it brings along with it this yellow fluorescent protein. Uh, and that tags to, uh, to, um, to a beta tubulin, uh, which essentially is an actin uh, in, inside these cells. Uh, and it labels essentially uh, the entire cell. Uh, and again, what the microscope sees is monochromatic. So when we asked the Jankowski lab to give us some samples that we could take some really obscenely high resolution images of, um, this is what the microscope sees initially. And so again, what I'm looking for when we're looking through the microscope is we're looking for a, a reasonable composition. And so we're, I'm using a lot of tools that photographers every day use. So for example, in this image, we use the rule of thirds um, to compose these two cells together. 
Um, and what's really neat about this is this is this is this seems like it might be a little easy to do, but there are hundreds of thousands of these cells all surrounding and growing on top of each other. So locating ones that are somewhat separate uh, is a complicated thing to do within these sample preps. So finding it is kind of a stroke of luck um, to, to locate uh, sections like this where you have two clear, obvious cells uh, talking to each other. And that's kind of the first thing that I saw and noticed and, and the first word that popped into my head uh, when we saw this this frame uh, was communication because you can clearly tell that the cells are talking to each other um, if you look at closely at the monochrome image on the left you'll notice that the left hand cell is actually a bit brighter uh, than the the right hand cell um, and that's fortunate for us uh, because from an artistic standpoint that allows us to tease out that one cell uh, and combine it with uh, an image of that uh, of its neighboring cell um, so we use some pretty advanced uh, segmentation algorithms to be able to pull apart the, uh, the information from that uh, and to basically make a mask ultimately in Photoshop uh, to outline and highlight those cells. And those, uh, the, the final sort of PSD resistance of the, of the, the, the composition, um, all these individual dendrites were hand touched up um, with a Wacom tablet and a pen. Uh, so that took hours and hours and hours of use because this image roughly is 8,000 pixels uh, in both dimensions. Um, so there's a lot of data there uh, to, to work with. And the one of the final scientific images I wanted to show you uh, today um, is one that is particularly close to my heart. So this is, this is a really good example of where the technology of microscopy is moving uh, today. And, and, and we like to, our core uh, is pretty well funded and we like to stay on the cutting edge uh, of imaging technology. And ultimately we're looking for ways to kind of circumvent some of the issues that you have with really high resolution microscopy. And one of the main issues you have is, is that when you're looking at uh, a cell or you're looking at something in, in extremely high resolution, you're also looking at a very, very small window. Um, so you're only seeing maybe a few hundred microns at any one given time uh, when you're looking at that high resolution. Well, as we talked about in the previous uh, example of all these cells growing on top of each other, the same thing happens in uh, you know, higher organ systems. Um, so this is actually a, a cross section through or an image of a sagittal view of an adult mouse brain. Um, and so there's larger ramifications of what happens to these, these high resolution components relative to the larger organ. Um, and we like to be able to see all of that kind of in the same time, in the same volume. And so uh, one of the things we look for um, with these guys is samples that can be essentially imaged intact. Um, so this is, this again is an adult mouse brain. So on the left hand side, you can see the olfactory bulb uh, all the way through the center uh, of the brain out to the cerebellum on the other side. And what you're looking at are blood vessels. And these blood vessels are labeled via perfusion. Um, so what, what these researchers do is, is that they perfuse the animal, basically inject a dye into the heart uh, of an anesthetized uh, mouse uh, and let this dye replace the blood. Uh, while the animal unfortunately is uh, exsanguinating, uh, but it it, uh, it replaces the blood, and and what's what's left is the is the fluorescent dye, and then this brain can be extracted from the animal, and then it goes through a process called tissue clearing, uh, where we strip lipid essentially away from the the, the cells in the brain, um, and then we can immerse the brain into a, a solution that matches the refractive index of the gel that we use to hold everything together. And so what that does essentially is it renders the brain completely transparent um, to light. So when you hold it up to the light, you wouldn't be able to see it at all, which is wonderful for getting uh, fluorescence excitation from lasers uh, into the specimen to be able to image deep. Um, so these blood vessels, uh, just to give you kind of an idea of this, the, the composition of this image is not spectacular, right? It's just showing you kind of a morphological uh, image of the brain. What's really powerful about this uh, image is really what data is contained within it. And so if I zoom in here a couple of times, I'm gonna go in and in and in, and you can go down essentially to the micron level um, inside this brain. So I'm gonna back up and kind of do that again for you. Um, just to give you kind of a frame of reference on this data set, there are 96,000 images uh, in this data set. 
Um, essentially, we have um, a Z stack, which is the, the uh, what you're looking at uh, uh, into the monitor. There's a thousand images uh, collected over that stack. Uh, and then this is a 12 by 8 tile, which means there's 12 images taken um, along the horizontal axis and then eight images in the vertical axis. And all this stuff is put together and assembled together in post uh, to be able to see a visualization like this. So this final image rendering is roughly 30,000 pixels long um, in the, the long dimension, um, generating an image file that's roughly 1.2 terabytes uh, in file size. So just to kind of get a little geeky on you <laughs> with the statistics of that, but the, the point is, is that we can achieve resolution with this type of microscopy, um, which I should mention uh, is actually light sheet microscopy uh, that we're using to collect the data set here. So this, this microscope can achieve resolution down to the micron level. So we're looking at roughly two microns uh, in resolution here, but a field of view that is in total uh, roughly 15 millimeters uh, across. So just to give you a sense of scale for what that might look like, if we blew this 15 millimeters up to roughly a meter, right? So in the US at three feet, right? And so if we're looking at something that's three feet long, the finest detail that we can see in this data set is roughly the width of a human hair. Um, so that that level of detail and structure within these within these data sets is tremendous for us. Uh, just being able to characterize the vasculature down to the capillary level, really. Um, these larger vessels you can see by eye, but the capillary level is, is really where a, a lot of the magic is. Um, and so that's really uh, arguably where where this technology is going. So being able to look at these really really big fields of view at ultra high resolution um, is something that's incredibly important here uh, and and has wide ramifications in the scientific community. So in addition to microscopy, I'm going to finish uh, today just scrolling very quickly through a couple of images. I'm a photographer in addition to a micrographer, um, and so uh, I spend uh, not nearly enough time uh, doing landscape photography um, as well as, uh, as underwater photography. I'm also a diver uh, when I get the opportunity, which is not often, unfortunately, these days. Um, and then COVID, of course, limits us to do any travel uh, at the moment. Uh, so we can't get to our favorite dive locations or we can't get to our favorite landscape locations. Um, and so this past uh, summer, while we're quarantined for months on end, um, I actually spent most of that time building a microscope in my office um, to image kind of neat stuff at home, right? This is a, a, a look at a wing vein through a Morphoditis butterfly. Um, imaged at roughly 20x. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you with a kind of a cool uh, spider uh, that we acquired uh, through really kind of a neat uh, little uh, uh, organism called the mud dauber. Uh, so the mud dauber in Texas is kind of a wasp uh, and it builds these wild nests, these mud nests, and how it feeds the, um, the, uh, the little uh, eggs that it implants in that nest is by going around and stunning spiders. Um, and so it'll stun them and completely paralyze them and they'll stuff them into the nest. Uh, and when the, the idea is that when the embryo hatches, it'll feed on the, the spiders that are still alive in there. So sometimes when you knock down these nests, you find these spiders and they're completely alive when you're photographing them, unfortunately, uh, but they are, um, but they are uh, uh, effectively dead and it's completely still, which is neat for photography, but uh, not so great for the for the end organism. So thank you very much again to the Wistar Institute and Nikon Instruments for having me. Uh, and if you'd like to see more images, you can you can see them at my website at MilesKirk.com uh, or on Instagram at ZMicros. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jason. So look at that passion, technology, artistic license. This is all part of what makes the images in small worlds so good. Okay, so next we have Nadia Efimova. Nadia works right here in Philadelphia at Amicus Therapeutics. This is the first year that she has entered, and I'm sure it won't be the last that we see of her. Nadia also struck a chord with the judges this year and received two images of distinction for her work. You've already been admiring one of her images, and that's the one of the magenta colored differentiated neuron set in a sea of blue neural stem cells. It has such a wonderful graphic quality to it that it made the perfect image for us to use for our invitation to tonight's event. So here's Nadia to tell us a little bit more about it. So welcome, Nadia. Turn on your 
um, your camera and your mic. And Jason, if you would be so kind as to turn off your your mic, I think it's still on. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So thank you, uh, James, for a great introduction and for using my image as a banner uh, for this event. Um, uh, so I came to Philadelphia about uh, almost 10 years ago, and for seven years I've been uh, working at University of Pennsylvania uh, with Professor Tatiana Svitkina. In her lab, I learned how to do platinum replica transmission electron microscopy of cells at a skeleton, in addition of my knowledge uh, of fluorescent microscopy. And here you can see uh, two examples of such uh, of uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy. On the left, you can see non-extracted uh, sample of cultured neurons depicting synapses uh, formed by uh, axons in red and dendrites in green. And on the right, you can see our image, which was uh, submitted uh, to Journal of Cell uh, Biology. It's our cover image. And uh, which shows a uh, cytoskeletal, uh, cytoskeletal interaction between uh, two human endothelial cells uh, It's in an uh, extracted sample. Uh, two years ago, I uh, moved from academia to industry and joined uh, Amicus Therapeutics, where I work uh, at microscopy core as a scientist. Our company is working on developing drugs for treatment of rare genetic diseases, uh, such as Pompe disease, uh, which is caused by deficiency of enzyme, which needs uh, to break down uh, complex sugars in our body. And as a result, such sugar called glycogen uh, would build up in our body and uh, would cause dysfunction of di different organs. Uh, Button disease, it's a group of diseases which characterized by abnormal accumulation of uh, certain lipids uh, in neurons, and it uh, results in progressive deter deterioration of the brain. Uh, CDKL5 deficiency disorder, uh, mutations in CDKL5 gene uh, reduce the amount of uh, active CDKL5 protein uh, or alter uh, its activity in nerve cells uh, in the brain, which leads to uh, which leads to problems with uh, brain development. So, how does microscopy help us in our research? Uh, it helps us to see morphological changes in uh, disease cells and tissues. Uh, such as uh, changes in um, uh, organelle size and shape, uh, protein abundance and its localization within cells and tissues, accumulation of substrate, and also effects of treatment on diseased cells and tissues. Uh, it helps us to observe uh, uptake of recombinant proteins uh, in cells, uh, how, uh, how much it could get in, into, how fast and where it would localize. Also to see if engineered DNA constructs uh, express and localize properly within a cell. But for me, as for many other microscopies, uh, microscopy is also about an art. Uh, it allows us uh, to see uh, the beauty of cells, its hidden world, and shapes and colors which we cannot see in ordinary life. And last year, uh, so. Every year, Nikon Small World uh, publishes uh, amazing images from microscopists all, all around the world. And uh, last year, I decided to share my passion and submit uh, submitted a few images uh, to this competition. And two of my images were uh, recognized as an image of distinction. Uh, one of the images called single neuron in the field of non-differentiated uh, mouse neural stem cells. So those uh, neural stem cells were developed for in vitro platform uh, to test uh, gene therapy products. And while I was uh, culturing them and differentiated into neurons, I got two population of cells. One is non-differentiated cells and neurons. And when I looked at my samples under microscope, I was uh, surprised uh, to see the field of uh, comp-like shaped non-differentiated cells depicted here in blue colors and uh, neurons resting on top of the cell layer. 
And in many places, I mostly could see multiple neurons which would form uh, contacts with each other and with underlying cells. But then I went across of uh, this field with just single neuron and uh, it looked very isolated um, and it made it beautiful. And uh, I tried different color combinations and uh, I think this one uh, is was uh, the most uh, um, appealing and uh, it allows uh, two neuron to pop up in, the, in this field of blue non-differentiated cells. Another image, uh, which also won uh, the image of distinction, is ovarian cells of a cabbage mouse. So this is a high five cell line, uh, which is commonly used for expression of recombinant protein, but it's uh, not, not for microscopy. But I've been, uh, I've been asked to look at, at protein expression and at expression efficiency in those cells. They were expressing different proteins. And uh, to visualize cell outlines, I added a dye to label uh, actin cytoskeleton. And when I looked under microscope, it, I was surprised because when you look under low magnification and with transmitted light, you see uh, small spheres, uh, nothing exciting. And but when I stain them and look at high magnification, uh, it was nothing but, but ordinary, and they uh, remind me of prickly hedgehogs. And I inverted this image uh, to make a white background and dark cell outlines to look at more contrast and pleasing. But uh, my work, uh, so I have also other few images which were not submitted to Nikon Small World, but which I would like to share with you. Uh, lots of my projects include work uh, with primary culture uh, neurons, and um, it's a very good model uh, to look at neurodegenerative processes. And here you can see red cortical uh, neurons uh, with uh, uh, immunolabeled dendrites in yellow purple colors and nuclei in green. On this image, neurons were treated with virus carrying CDKL5 genes. And uh, neurons, after about a week of expression, were stained for CDKL5 protein, which is a magenta color. And also the dendrite were stained uh, in green color. And here you can see a uh, mouse cortical neuron which look like entangled in an axonal meshwork. Uh, axons here in blue and dendrites in magenta and actin cytoskeleton in yellow. But uh, not all, I don't work only with neurons. I work with many other cell lines and one of them is COS7 cell line, which is, a, which, uh, is derived from kidney cells of green monkey. It's a very good uh, cell line to check uh, expression uh, of engineered DNA constructs. And I commonly, I also commonly use it for uptake uh, assays where in, uh, engineered uh, recombinant proteins uh, would be added to cells for an uptake. And here you can see uh, COS7 cells uh, with actin cytoskeleton labeled in purple colors. Uh, lysosomes in uh, green and Golgi apparatus in blue. Uh, human skin fibroblast here labeled uh, with labeled actin cytoskeleton in yellow uh, and the cytic vesicles in, uh, in red and lysosomes in blue. Uh, while working on a pumpy disease, I did an assay, uh, uptake assay, where, uh, uh, where engineered um, uh, recombinant enzyme was added to uh, red myoblasts. And here you can see cells uh, with internalized protein uh, stained in yellow, uh, lysosomes in magenta, and uh, actin cytoskeleton in cyan. 
And I want to finish my presentation with an image of Neurosphere, uh, which is a free floating cluster of neural stem cells. Here it's stained for, with marker of, of neurons and, uh, in blue and astrocytes in yellow. And uh, if we see fine claws, we always can find some similar structures. And uh, in the next slide, you can see side by side uh, image of uh, nearest uh, image of uh, supernova remnant, which is a 140 uh, light years in diameter. Uh, and on the right, you, you, in comparison, you see an image of neurosphere, which is only 250 microns in the in diameter. And here I want to say uh, thank you uh, to Brian Rains for his valuable advices and for his support, uh, to Dr. Tatiana Svitkina for her great mentorship, to Nikon Small World for recognizing my images as uh, images of distinction. Um, I'm sorry. And uh, the Vistar Institute, uh, for giving me opportunity to talk about my passion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia. So that's how you get started your first year. I can't wait to see how long it takes you to get to first place. It'll be soon. So <laughs> congratulations. Um, so I'd like uh, all of our panelists to just come on for sort of like one last bow, if you'd be so kind. So everybody just put your cameras on. Um, and again, um, it's it's been a great group. Uh, I apologize to everyone for going just a little bit over. Uh, so, you know, at this point, I know you know we don't have our regular audience, but I'd like to uh, clap for all of you and and thank you so much for uh, uh, attending uh, for this. And uh, your images are wonderful. We look forward to seeing more of them every year. Um, and I guess for the rest of you, uh, thank you. Well, this is the end of our formal pres uh, presentation, so we'll need to wrap things up. So I have a few thank yous I got to throw out here as well. Um, I'd like to first of all congratulate our winners and extend a big thank you to them and to all of our audience for showing up this year. Thank you. Uh, Arena, Dan, Jason, Nadia, you've truly brought a small bit of light and excitement into an otherwise cold and dismal winter, at least here in Philadelphia. Um, so thank you to Eric uh, Flem as well, our long-term partner from Nikon. And behind the scenes, thank you to Darian and Sylvia and Markeisha and our communications uh, and marketing team at Wistar, as well as, well as uh, Eric Sopp, who's our wizard, uh, running the tech behind the scenes. And finally, a big thank you to Dr. Dario Altieri, our president, CEO, and director of the Wistar Institute Cancer Center for his continued support of these events. So here's hoping that we'll be able to continue our tradition and meet in person next year, hopefully, hoping. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Take care, stay safe, good night. <laughs>